Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I want to talk about panhandlers. And why do I want to talk about panhandlers? Well, they're everywhere. <laughs> it seems like that. Does anybody recognize this guy? This is Lewis. He actually lives in Portland. We'll talk a little bit more about him. But uh, he's pretty representative of what our panhandlers look like here in Gurney, standing with a sign alongside the road. It's a, a topic that has gotten a lot of discussion and a lot of interest. I decided that it was necessary, and Tom and I discussed uh, presenting this topic uh, at this meeting after I was on Neighborhood Watch. I, I live in the neighborhood just a little bit west of where all of you live, and uh, there was a post on next door that asked the question, are you bothered by panhandlers in the village of Gurney? And there was a survey. And it was only up for about uh, a little over 24 hours before it was shut down, but there were between comments and responses to the poll, uh, well over 100 interactions with that. There was 40 some comments and almost 100 uh, responses to the poll. And some very interesting comments, you know, that, uh, that they are, they're a blight on the community and we need to get rid of them, to we should show compassion, to we need to pass a law, that the police need to do something about this. Just a, a cross section of responses. And poll, similarly, uh, the responses were were varied and changed over time. Uh, there, I noticed uh, yesterday, within the last couple of days, there was another question that was posted on Nextdoor along the same thing. And I chimed in from home on Nextdoor and, and invited folks to come to these meetings to learn about that. And then within 24 hours, that message was gone. The, whoever posted it had removed it. So I don't know if that got heated or contentious or what prompted them to remove that, but I noticed that it's not there any longer. So. I thought it was important to talk about talk about the issue and talk about why and how we formulated our response and what we're uh, we're doing to address the issue. Talk about the facts. If that sounds all right, that's the plan for tonight. So, what is panhandling? Well, panhandling is defined by village ordinance very simply: asking for money from a stranger in a public place. Now, that can take a lot of different forms. But is it legal? And the short answer to that question is yes it is legal to panhandle. And that starts with our U.S. Constitution. And why is the Constitution important? Well, the first part of a police officer's oath when they are sworn in as a police officer is I swear to support uh, and uphold the United States Constitution. So we can't apply the Constitution as an afterthought. The Constitution has to be fundamental in how we develop our strategy and how we're going to approach this issue. Of course, the First Amendment, which I hope everybody's uh, familiar with, uh, guarantees your right to free speech. And how does free speech make a difference in panhandling? Well, there may not seem to be a direct connection, but the courts have made a, a very distinct connection. We'll talk a little bit about that, because these court cases were very influential in us determining how we can respond to this issue. And Reed versus Gilbert, to make this thing even a little bit more obscure, was a case that actually talked about a church sign in Gilbert, Arizona. But what that decision determined was that the municipality, in this case the city of Gilbert, cannot regulate what the content of a sign is. The facts of this case really are not really all that relevant, but the, the, the city had certain rules for political signs, certain rules for commercial signs, certain rules for non-commercial signs, and they were eventually sued by a church that didn't like the way that they were regulated differently, and the courts upheld, the Supreme Court actually said, you can't differentiate. Then Schaumburg versus Citizens for Better Environment. Uh, this was an outfit that was doing some soliciting, and Schaumburg's ordinance was they tried to, to only allow responsible solicitors. So 75% of what you collect needs to be used for charitable purposes was the way that uh, Schaumburg's ordinance was written. I'm assuming that uh, this Citizens for Better Environment did not spend 75% of the money that they raised uh, for, for their cause. They had administrative costs or whatever they were doing with the money. So the village of Schaumburg took some enforcement action on them. They sued. The federal court came back and said, you can't tell people what to do with the money that they're soliciting. So kind of see how this all comes together to formulate uh, some direction on panhandlers. Speed versus Sims is a very old case from Grand Rapids, Michigan. They took the very simple approach that panhandling itself is disorderly. Can't do it. There's no panhandling at all. That uh, ordinance survived for decades and was struck down as too broad. It's, it's, that was one of the cases that determined this is constitutionally protected free speech. You just can't make it illegal. Uh, the city of Springfield right here in Illinois took a, a different approach. They said, all right, we're not going to make 
panhandling illegal all over, we're going to limit panhandling to areas outside of the historical district. So the idea there was you can't panhandle in front of Abe Lincoln's house. Seems reasonable. Do it wherever you want to. We don't want it in this area. And the courts came back and said, can't do it. It's constitutionally protected free speech. You can't tell people where they can and can't do it. It's, it's legal. Uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, they, similarly, let's pick an area where we don't want people to panhandle. They, had, they set up a buffer zone around there, uh, around a mall. Said, you, we don't want you to panhandle here. And again, that was similarly struck down by the court. The city of Portland, Oregon, that's where Lewis is from. That picture uh, that we started with, he is uh, the poster child of panhandling in Portland. That's a newspaper picture. That ruling was about median strips. We don't want panhandlers standing on the median strip in the roads. It's a traffic hazard. It's a problem. We, we don't want it in Portland. The court case reversed that. You can't tell people that they can't panhandle on the median strips. So, this last one is, uh, is the Pindac case. That is one that was, uh, that was settled last year in 2016. And in that case, it was down at the Daily, Daily Center. And the idea there was that they did not want panhandlers in that area around Daily Plaza. So Cook County deputies that are responsible for maintaining court security, uh, they would go out and they would move the panhandlers away from, from the building and away from Daily Plaza. Again, determined to be unconstitutional. In this particular case, it was a local court, and they awarded Mr. Pindak and one other person that was involved in that lawsuit uh, lost wages for the time that they were away and not able to panhandle. Uh, and they awarded them $100, or no, $10 a day for, for them being moved from there. So Pindak got $1,500, and he was quoted in the paper as talking about what a life-changing amount of money that is. One of the things you need to know about civil suits like that is when you lose, you are often responsible for the plaintiff's attorney's fees. And that case was litigated for six years. So Mr. Pindak got $1,500. His attorneys got six figures. So that lays the groundwork for how do we approach this, and we have to be very careful about the approach we take because we can't uh, violate somebody's constitutional rights. And we certainly can't expose the village to liability that comes along with situations like that. So how is it that some communities do have ordinances or laws that make panhandling illegal? The ones that are constitutional address different behaviors. Um, and those, those are the ordinances that you may have heard of or heard talked about, aggressive panhandling. And what that describes is if you commit a battery or disorderly conduct or you're trespassing, really what, it, what aggressive panhandling ordinance does is it takes other crimes, other offenses, and puts them in one place in a panhandling ordinance. Uh, we discussed that. Is that something that makes sense for the village? And our decision and our opinion of that is it really doesn't give us any additional tools because we have all those other laws on the books. If somebody's being disorderly, we can arrest them for that. If they're committed battery, certainly we can arrest them for that. If they're trespassing where they're not supposed to be, we can arrest them for that. We don't need to have an, a separate ordinance to establish that. What we did do in the village of Gurney is the village board passed an ordinance uh, that added panhandling into an existing ordinance that prohibits soliciting in the street. So you may have seen firemen with their boots, and there's Tootsie Roll Day and Flower Day, and different solicitations that happen in the road where people approach your car and you give them money. That's not legal here in Gurney. So while you have seen that in places, you, will not, you, do, you don't see that here. Uh, we have an ordinance that prohibits it. So if we have a group that comes in and says it's Flower Day or it's Tootsie Roll Day or whatever we want to solicit for our cause, we send them a nice letter that says you are welcome to, to solicit funds, but you can't step in the roadway to do it. So we have made a decision in this community that to be out in the roadway doing that is, is not safe, and so we don't allow it. So by adding panhandling to that definition, we have not singled out panhandlers and said they can't do it we have added that to one of the soliciting activities that is prohibited in the street. Does that make sense? So just to give you an idea of how often we address these things, Tom just ran through a whole lot of numbers uh, of calls for service in the various uh, neighborhoods in, in, in where you live and also village-wide. And this takes a look at, this is from the same source, so it's the same numbers, over a three-year period uh, beginning in 2014 and ending at the end of last year, 268 complaints relevant to Panhandle. So the sense that they're everywhere may be because we do see these folks in, in highly visible places, but it's not something that we are addressing on a daily basis. In fact, it's one call 
an average of one every five days. So then if you look at, over that same three-year period, how many calls for service did we respond to, that is over 200,000, so 187 calls a day. Again, same numbers you were looking at before, just applied a little bit longer period of time uh, to give you that perspective. So what do we do? How do we respond to these calls? Well, our officers are trained to, to do two things, basically, when they respond to these uh, calls of panhandlers. And the first thing is to assess the need. They come in and they identify the person, they get to know their story a little bit. What kind of help do you need? Do you need any help? And if they need that help, then we offer it to them. Very often they don't, and we'll explain that a little bit, a little bit later. But then in addition to offering help, we're going to enforce the law. And if they're violating the law, we're going to arrest them. So the officers have a card that they carry with them and that they offer directly to, uh, to the folks that are panhandling. It's a two-sided card, and the first side has resources that are available. And it starts with PADS, and PADS is the agency in Lake County that handles the uh, homeless problem, the homeless issue. Uh, they triage folks. They have, uh, they have somebody on staff, actually, that will go out and make contact with somebody who's panhandling again, to determine what their needs are and to get them help. Other side of that card is responsibilities. So it talks about, and uh, bullet points, the things that we just talked about. What's legal, what's illegal. And if, if you're considering a, taking up panhandling, this is kind of the do's and don'ts, so you can determine what you need to do or not do to not get arrested. Our officers really are, are they're not limited in just providing information. Uh, we do have a good Samaritan fund. We can provide some short-term immediate needs if there's somebody that genuinely needs a hotel room or gas money, something like that. We have the ability to provide that. We also very frequently provide transportation to pads if they need a place to stay. Uh, so our officers are engaged in this and they want to help. Very often, help is not what's, what's asked of us, though. The second card that I wanted to share with you is the card from pads. And in, in talking with, uh, with the folks from pads, and kind of helping us determine what is the best way to respond to this. Uh, they provided some, some great insight. And their advice to you, the, the, uh, the executive director of PADS, would be if you are providing money to somebody who's panhandling or providing a meal, uh, you're just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. You're helping them sus sustain the crisis that they're in. This, this panhandling will get them from one day to the next, uh, but it is not a long-term solution. So certainly you have a right just like the constitutional right of the panhandler is protected on their ability to ask you for money, uh, you are constitutionally protected in how you respond to them. You can give them money or you cannot. If they become aggressive, then they start moving into an area where it's criminal activity. There is no shortage of services available in Lake County for somebody who's homeless or somebody who's in need, but very often these folks that are there, and you see the same people. If you see them, you, you know who they are. We know all their names. We deal with them on a regular basis. Uh, they stay within the law and what they're doing, uh, but they're not interested in help. They want to stay on the corner that they're on, and they want to be able to, uh, to do what it is they're doing. So we give them the space to do that as long as they're doing it within the law. But if they break the law, then we're going we're gonna to arrest them.